Patrick Fenor here, co-founder at Vetted Biz and Visa Franchise. Excited to have on Todd Houghton, who's the president of HomeWatch Caregivers. Todd, thanks for joining today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Patrick. I appreciate it. So I won't out you on your age, but I understand you've been in the franchising space since you were in your teenage years and working with your parents' multi-unit cookie empire. Can you tell us a little bit how you went from basically running a bunch of uh, cookie franchises to the home healthcare space? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I started, uh, as you said, like in my teens with my family and was afforded the opportunity to run a cookie empire and back when they were big in that, that era. And then when I graduated college, I transferred over to the franchisor side and have spent pretty much all of my career on the franchisor side. Um, probably 15 years ago, got into the human care side of things. I started out with uh, franchising in the early childhood care space and then transitioned about 12 years ago to the, the senior care space and have been with a, a couple of the different home care franchise organizations. And then about 10 months ago, came on as the, the leader of HomeWatch. And what attracted you at HomeWatch caregivers to, to join? What was it about their their operations, culture, or you know, also what you could, you know, bring and get them to the next level? Yeah, I think, you know, first I'd say like for me, it is a, it's all about the passion in the space. So what what our franchisees do every day in delivering the best care possible. The second piece for me is all about allowing those franchisees to fulfill their dreams of being in business ownership. So wherever they're at, uh, wherever they come from in the world, it's it's very exciting for me to be able to see them have those milestones along the way. Um, and then when it came to HomeWatch, just the opportunity that was presented through our parent company and our private equity company to focus on this brand, uh, really forge forward with growth for the brand across the, the country and across the, the globe, essentially. And then also having the uh, ability to to take what I want to do with the brand as far as being innovative and bringing technology into the space and things like that. Having the essentially the, the wide open space to do that was very exciting for me. So that's what attracted me. What are some of the benefits for being part of like a, a larger kind of network where you have authority brands and you have these other franchise brands and the ecosystem with HomeWatch that are in different industries, but at the end of the day, franchising is like a very unique business model. I'm sure there's some shared learning. Yeah. I mean, there, there's there's so many synergies that work with uh, within us having our 17 brands, right? So we we benefit from shared services, which is which, which is great for our franchisees because it allows us at the support center to have lower overhead, if you will, um, because we can share services across the 17 brands, such as marketing, legal, accounting, um, several others as well. Uh, so that's that's actually one of the big benefits on the operations side. Imagine the you can just afford much better talent than yeah, if it was just HomeWatch separately having a COO or head of legal, like you right. couldn't afford the top talent. Yep, at, that's absolutely correct. And then the other piece of it too is there are synergies between the brands. So it allows, um, you know, for, like in our brand with HomeWatch, we also have a, a, a cleaning authority is one of our brands. And that allows us to do synergies with them where a client might need a weekly schedule to have somebody come in and, and do that deeper clean work, which we don't do. So we can have that synergy. Or uh, we have a client that's trying to live at home because that's their wish. We have, you know, electric, we have plumbing, uh, we have AC. So if anything's going wrong at the home, it's much easier for us to work across brands to get those repairs done. So there's all those synergies that really help each of one of our brands uniquely. And then just the power behind our, our private equity company is phenomenal as well with everything that they have in the brand, different brands, even outside of authority brands that they have that help us with some of our technology solutions, other things that we want to do, which is great. So it puts us in a unique position. Yeah, I imagine it seems like really value added smart money where they're funding your business and growth, but they're coming in with a lot of strategy and a lot, probably a lot of relationships to help you get. Absolutely. There. Yeah, it makes it makes it just great for me as a leader where I can be like, OK, who can I call from you know within our organization to help with this? And sure enough, there's somebody there to help. Who is caregiving for and who's it not for? Like people looking to get an entrepreneurship in a franchise, whether it is with HomeWatch or not, like who should consider caregiving as a business opportunity and who should not? Yeah. So, you know, one thing to always be mindful, there's so many choices out there in the world of what you could do for franchising. Like, I want to be a franchisee. What do I want to do? Then you have to look at the different categories of it. In the home care space, one, absolutely you have to be passionate about what you do day in and day out. Um, as I said, you know, you're, you're helping somebody through, I'd say two thirds of our business is really on the, the senior side of it. And then the other third is, is other people like 
rehabbing from hospital stays and things like that. But you have to be passionate about that. They're in their time of need and we need to make sure that we fulfill that as a franchisee or our franchisee fulfill that. They also have to realize that it's a 24 seven business. You're not, you know, in a, an eight to five job anymore. You are actually having to be on and be willing to be on in that 24 seven. Granted, you, fill, you know, you fill in your team to take care of some of the things, but you're still the yeah. owner. So. But if there's some major incident, it's got to kick up to you. And well, yeah. I would imagine maybe after you have a hundred caregivers, you have a COO or some rule that. Yeah, it absolutely. Many, 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 of our franchisees, many of our franchisees have that structure, right? They'll have a, you know, an executive director or COO or whatever, and a, you know, a, a head of nursing, different, different levels that take care of things for them. But at the end of the day, the franchisee is still responsible and, and it's, you know, your doors didn't close at five o'clock on Friday, allowing you to take the weekend off. And, you know, I'm, I'm always all about that when we're doing meet the team days and things like that and just making sure they're aware, you know, it's, it's you hard, it. hard business. It's hard. It's not easy. Yeah. I mean, sadly, there's a lot of selling going on in franchise. That's like, this is easy. Like, you know, you don't have to work that hard, but I, I'm still looking for those opportunities. Like, you know, I'll, I'll invest my money in something I don't have to, work at all and just like collect like just a you know amazing return on investment and i haven't found it yet <laughs> yeah when you find it let me know and then maybe i'll yeah. switch from the franchise their side back to the franchisee side but yeah it's it's one of those things like you know I, I i really believe when i talk with prospective franchisees i'm like you really have to be passionate about this day in and day out it's not like you can hire somebody to run the kitchen for you or hire somebody to run the 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 cash register for you, right? You, you're going to have to oversee all that and make sure it's happening every day. And what's the scale up like? Like you start the business. I imagine you're splitting your time trying to get clients, customers, mostly seniors, as well as recruiting the, the caregivers. Like after a year, two years, three years, like what's that organizational chart look like? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we, uh, we have a very strategic roadmap for our new franchise owners when they actually come on. And like once, when they're getting ready to open the doors, um, the requirement is that there has to be a minimum of two people uh, in their operation. One is the operations person, one is their community marketing or salesperson. So the operations person is, is handling all those day-to-day -day office thing, things of getting caregivers recruited, doing the scheduling, doing the, the billing, payroll, those types of things. And then the, the community person is the one that's out there being the face, building those networking relationships with referral sources, getting that business to come in the door. You know, we have people that, that are amazing that within three months, like yeah, I have to add a person in the office or add a second person in the office within six, third person within six months, they're great. Typically I'd say somewhere around that nine month range is when that third person comes in to help. Um, and it does, I should clarify, it does vary by state because sometimes some states require a nurse on board. Just to too. get the license takes a while or you have to have some other person on the staff yeah, because of licensing. So you do have those those unique things by state. But I would say um, most of our offices are have their foundation by about 12 to 13 months. And that would be okay. typically four or five people. And then as they grow within 24, 36 months, they're starting to add people below that structure. And how many caregivers, like after two years of operating a home watch, are you like how many caregivers are you talking about? So a typical unit after about two years is about 60 to 70 caregivers. 60 to 70. Yeah. So, I mean, I imagine some of your franchisees were pretty happy with all these government incentives with like payroll protection with... Um... Yes. During during pandemic time and the, and the... Yes, that helped them stay open. It was a good thing, right? Because there's that whole challenge of how do we incentivize the caregivers to go into homes when the rest of the world is shut down? Um, and so allowing for like the PPC and the, the tax credits, things like that allows them exactly. to, you know, incentivize the caregivers more to want to go into the homes and do the right thing for our clients. So that was very helpful that we had that for them. And I, I mean, there's a trend. I, I don't know how it's going to continue, you know, in um, 2025 with maybe a new administration, but like, it seems like the benefits of having workers compared to contractors are, are pretty clear where the government's really incentivizing and that payroll percentage like is kind of mute when you consider all these other ancillary benefits that you get in terms of just having the W-2 worker, having them actually as an employee rather than a, a contractor. Yeah, it, it, but it takes a lot. Like, so from our perspective, from the support center perspective, we have to, we have to look for those benefits for our franchisees and provide it out to them and tell them how to go for it. 
You know, you're going to oh, have yeah. so many franchisees that don't know what to do or where to I mean, start. It all looks like a scheme. These, uh, I get emails every day about like per employee, $13,000 tax credit. Like, right. Unless and, you have like a trusted other business owner or, the, or even a franchise system and the franchise or is on top of this, like, I, I could easily see how you would not do it. Yeah, because you're, you're, you're spot on. You're like, wait a minute, this sounds too good to be true. I mean, I was brought up that way. If it sounds too good to be true, it's got to be too good to be true. And then you get these emails daily or whatever. And, and somebody like at our support center that on my team is, is looking into them and investigating and letting our owners know. But I know there's so much more opportunity, not just within our organization, but you know, other companies out there that can take advantage of those, those things to incentivize employees and, and do better retention. What are some of the ways that you're working on or you've worked on to lower people leaving and caregivers staying more time? Yeah. I mean, so, we, you know, I, I'll, I'll toot my horn for a second. We just won an award a couple months ago for the most innovative retention program through a franchise publication. Um, there was probably I don't know, a thousand entries from different franchise organizations. So the fact that we, we took home the prize is pretty exciting. And, and, uh, I have a, a workforce, we call it our workforce solutions team. So that's uh, on our support center side that works on that. And there's so many things that we do now to focus on how do we retain. And one of the biggest things, biggest components of that program was really about how, what's your culture, right? And so each franchisee has to develop their culture and they have to understand that their caregivers are the ones that make the money for them. So many times, you know, not just in my organization, but organizations I've been in in the past, I hear franchisees, you know, be upset and, and not handle things appropriately with caregivers. And it's like, those are your bread and butter. You need to focus on yeah, that. You, you wouldn't to... be here if you, if it wasn't for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So really focusing first on the, on the culture aspect. Um, and then we, we do talk uh, about a lot of benefit opportunities that are like free or, or low cost that a franchise owner should focus on and offer out to their, their caregivers to incentivize them to be part of that. And then one of the other things that we are now, we're, we're actually in pilot through our innovation is that we have offices that now guarantee 40 hours to their caregivers a week. And it's through a, a whole different uh, service line that we're, we're working on uh, and getting ready to launch out. But that really helps with that retention. Now that caregiver knows, well, I'm getting my 40 hours. Unfortunately, they may still have to work another job, you know, to really be able to make enough money, but at least they know they're getting the 40 hours from home watch caregivers. They don't have to think, oh, maybe I'm only getting X and then I got to go over to this other company and work X, go to this company and work X. To well, get for to culturally, work. a lot of times they're working at like multiple caregiving companies. And right. Even yeah, yeah that's, that's what I'm going with. That. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and then our franchisees can't get them to work because they're already scheduled somewhere else. Right. But so by guaranteeing that 40 hours a week, the economics of it, when you look at it all, it works out so much better for our franchisees. I love it. And I imagine the tech component really comes in in terms of like who's where, what scheduling opens up and like just being on, on top of it. So it's a win-win yeah, for yeah, the franchise absolutely. owner together with the employees. It's amazing where that's come in the last, you know, I'd say 12, 14 years I've been in the space where we can actually start to see that now through through the technology aspect, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so caregivers right here and I need them over here. They're close by. I can get <laughs> So it's great. It's 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 just such an exciting time. It really is. And I'm also sure from like a compliance perspective, it's nice having those checks where they arrived at such and such time at the site, they left at such and such time. Yeah. And that everything's kind of buttoned up. Yeah, and we we're driving through with um, some phenomenal new technology that actually it it gets away from the geofencing because they're actually going to clock in and out in the home on a device that's in the home. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So because you know, geofencing you can get pretty close, but they could still be like at the corner clocking in and never show up. So here they actually <laughs> physically have to be in the house to clock in and then clock out. So it's 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 pretty exciting to have all that going on, too. And for someone that's passionate, their strong cultural fit. What are we talking about in terms of investment amount to, to get started, including all the working capital? Yeah, I think, you know, so well, our franchise fee is $50,000 and then we have a, a working capital requirement. It's, you know, they need to have like around 125, 150 to really be able to get off the ground and get going and be able to operate for the first year. Makes sense. And is there a way for those corporate executive types that maybe they're making 200K and they want to make that much faster or right away? Is there a way for them to buy an existing HomeWatch Caregivers location? Do you guys help 
help with that at all? Yeah, absolutely. We have a full resale department within our team uh, that helps with um, our existing franchisees who are looking to exit. They're always, you're always going to have some attrition where somebody's like, okay, I've done this for many years. I'm ready to move on to something else. So we have great, you know, great units that are often up for resale. And so somebody will come in and buy that and already have it essentially ramped up for them. It'll cost a little more money for them, but yeah, you pay, pay you pay a premium, but you just depending on your right. financial situation, it can make a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. And that seems like something that Authority Brands has done well across the portfolio of seventeen, where they have allocated like a lot of resources to resales and understanding that the average franchisee staying in it for seven, eight years, and people yeah. move, and yeah. this is the type of business that you should be in the same city. And if your wife gets a job, it probably makes sense to sell it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, you know, it, so many people are surprised because I throw that number out all the time. I'm like, you know, the average lifetime is seven to eight years and then they're ready to get out. And they're like, that sounds like a marriage. And I'm like, it is a marriage. It was supposed to be a 10 year <laughs> marriage, but, but they wanted to go at seven. So, you know, we help them, but you know, and that's, that's, it's, it's very important. We, we actually start talking about it the day they sign their franchise agreement. You know, we start talking about the, what's your exit strategy? And we always, we always say it sounds weird weird, but we want you to be ready when you're ready yes. to go. And because yeah, a, lot of, a lot of them do miss that, right? If we don't talk about it, they miss it. And then the day comes that they want to sell and all of the ducks aren't in the row to be ready to, to sell. So that's why we always talk about it. And it's it. something that should be discussed up front with the spouse as well. Like, hey, I'm right. putting in these two years, it's going to be a ton of work, but it's for that later payday. Absolutely. You got to include the whole family in it. If you're doing it, like if you have, you have to have kids and they have to know like, Hey, you know, mom or dad, whoever's running the business might be working 12 hour days or 14 hour days, yeah. a couple of years, you know, but the benefits come and you get to go on nice vacations and do fun things. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what's impressed me the most, like we've studied like pretty much all the industries at in franchising at vetted biz. We've collected all the data and just the resell like midpoint investment to resale amount for home care franchises. I know home watch is part of this. It's like a really good return on your investment where say you invest a hundred K. I mean, these are being sold for three, four times what the owner is making. And it doesn't take much to add together, like what the margins are for the industry and, you know, average sales to realize like this could be getting you a million dollars if you grow it right. And uh, it could be a nice capital gain after already, earning income throughout those years. Absolutely. If you come in and you work hard for the first, you know, 12 months, 18 months out of it, you're going to start seeing great returns quickly after that. A lot of franchises aren't like that. So, I mean, no. the retail businesses, like, you know, talking about a cookie franchise where you, you have background with a lot of those brands, it's hard to recoup your capital investment. So, you know, it was it different, is. I think, in the heydays with the malls and everything, and they were just gold mines. But a lot of these retail type businesses, you open for 250 like a Subway, you open, I think, 330 and they're selling for 250 Right. So it's just like <laughs> a huge disconnect. Why would you ever open up a new Subway? When it, you're going to not make your, you're most likely not going to get your money back and you'll make yeah. just some income throughout the, the lifetime. And hopefully you're getting something back, not, you know, not yeah. having to just exactly. yeah. shutting yeah. the door. And that's like the, in any of the, the food sector, like those build outs are just ridiculous, right? I mean, you think about it, like you're, you're looking, you know, half a million, million, million and a half to build out a small strip center sandwich shop, you know, and, and so it's going to take you a while to get that return on that investment. It does not work well. And then even the big ones like a KFC, a Taco Bell, they're in the millions. Like, yeah, their earnings are kind of the same as like a Home Watch or another, you know, franchise yes. in your space. <laughs> yeah, they, they are. And and then you, I mean, and so when you look at those, I always say too, those those are the brands where you have to be set up to be a multi-unit owner yeah. to make the economics work because of the investment that you're putting into it, right? In our world, where in the in the home care space, it's a nice, easy investment. For most people and like yeah. you said a few minutes ago you're going to get a great return if you're doing Who's the right your thing biggest franchise owner like how many caregivers does he have our largest has probably about 500 caregivers okay probably. so that's a serious operation like what does that look like from like ceo ceo cfo they have every level i mean they you know their their overall revenue is larger than many total franchise organizations out there so they do very well. <laughs> Are you okay, Todd, having franchisees that kind of stop at the 60 caregivers? Or are you are you pushing people to grow and, and be at a 150, 200? Quite honestly, so from our support structure, you know, the way yeah. that 
way we structure, we have them bucketed, if you will, into different buckets. And so we have the certain bucket where we know that those are the growth oriented franchisees. So they get a certain type of support and we have sure. different levels. And then we have what we call, we just call it our steady state of franchisees. And those are the ones that, that you're referring to right there. They're happy, you know, doing what they do for their revenue. They're happy with the, the return that they get. So we know that what well, we'll try to get them to move the needle somewhat to increase we also know that you know they're not they're happy so we're not going to be able to do a lot of change in what they're doing and that can't be said you know i've, I've spoken to other brand executives franchisees of other groups where it's kind of you're moving up or you're moving out where there it's a little more cutthroat where you're really got to be growing all the time or they kind of want you out of the system so it's yeah. nice that you mold to kind of more the culture and lifestyle the franchisee wants at some point right and i've you know again doing this long enough like i always have i have this 80 20 rule right so 80 percent are definitely the ones that are accelerating that want to grow and that's where we're at the 20 percent part of those are definitely just happy with where they're at and that's fine and then there's a small percent within that that are the up and out like if they're not going to move up they need to they need to go because they're not doing anything good for our brand right no yeah. so there's a small percentage in there todd what metrics are you following daily or are your franchisees following daily any yeah. kpis you can think of yeah so i think we have two sets, right? So our franchisees are going to get more granular in what they follow on a day-to-day -day basis. From the franchisor's perspective, we're looking at our, our system-wide sales on a daily basis. We pull that up and see like, how do we do? We look at our hours on a, a daily basis. Um, and then we also are looking at not so much daily, maybe monthly, but we're looking at several other metrics that fall in there, like our unit growth, um, meaning new units that we're opening in a month. Um, we also look at client counts, like how many new clients do we add? Uh, in a week's time. So we, we monitor them. Um, they, some are daily, some are weekly, some are monthly um, from the franchise era perspective. Franchisee, they, they have similar ones, but then they're also a lot more focused on their labor. Um, you know, what's their labor percent running? Because that's their biggest controllable expense uh, within their unit, which affects their gross margins. So they follow that on a daily basis. They're following their, their lead conversions. So where are their leads coming from? Their lead conversions, their hours, their gross margin. Uh, their their sales uh, and then they're we, they always follow their net new hires as well. So how many new hires did they do in a week's time? Um, because mm -hmm. they can't grow without new caregivers coming in the door. Those are like the high level ones, and then it gets pretty grand. I think I have one location that has over three hundred. Good amount that you guys are tracking. Well, I have one that has over three hundred KPIs. One franchisee, I'm like, how do you, how do you do that? Like I you know I get on the call yeah. with him, and I'm like, that's a lie. And he's like, well, this is yeah. what I need. So, hey, I go through like five every story. day and then weekly I'll go through 50, but yeah, that, that's a lot. <laughs> he's got a lot. He's got a lot. And how about system wide sales? Any, any, can you share where your sales are at or how they're growing? Yeah. So we are about 15% above last year at this point um, and running about 6% above the budget that I put in place. So we're seeing some great numbers. We've done double digit increases since 2016. Um, year wow. over year over year. So phenomenal growth. Um, and, you know, as I'm working on 2024 already, which is hard to believe the budgets, but we'll anticipate another double digit increase in our system wide sales. And that's the same store. So that's not including. I was going to ask to clarify. So that's really impressive. Yeah, that's, that's just same store. So, um, which is fantastic. So even net, net of inflation, it's, it's still double digits yeah. where, where you'll see like some food franchises growing 4%, but net of inflation, it's, it's zero. <laughs> Yeah. yeah or depending exactly. on the year, it's like, it's not so, growing. Yeah. We're you know excited about how our franchisees are doing with it and the growth will continue for us. I mean, we know our niche, we know what we need to do. And is there much friendly competition between the franchisees to like continue growing? And is there like a leader? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we do put out a leaderboard. Yes, we do. So we put out, we, we put out our top 20 on a monthly basis so that they can see it. And that, that allows those that might not be in that top 20 to also reach out and be like, how do you do it? How do I get there? You know, and so that really um, promotes that competition, competitive nature. And then we also do um, what we call performance groups. And so we, uh, we have several performance groups and there's about eight franchisees in performance groups. So that really promotes that competitiveness within, within their performance groups as well, which helps those increases come. How often are, are franchisees meeting like in a, in a structured format? And their um, and their performance groups. Their performance groups meet quarterly and do that. And then we also have some that just meet like in their within their uh, their states or their region or like in their city. Like if there's multiple franchisees within a DMA, they'll meet like on a monthly basis, go out for dinner and, and really share their their 
their wins and their challenges. And that's what I really think helps make it a strong system. And what states are easiest to open up where it's also like a great market opportunity? Because I know certain states, it takes a long time, like getting the license. Yeah, there's some states that do take significant amount of time. Um, so Maryland is one of those where it can take, you know, 12 months to get a license. Um, most states, it's, it's you know, it, it average like 90 days to get a license. Okay. Uh, but you have a few states that have no, no licensure. Um, like uh, Idaho um, is not a licensure state, uh, so they can open right away. Arizona has no licensure, so they can open essentially right after they get their their business license, but they don't need to get the home care license. New Mexico also no no licensure, and Alabama I think is the other one. Okay, does it kind of net out where the licensure acts as like a competitive moat where you don't have as many mom and pops entering Maryland, and if you can it's, it's, stomach it's, it or getting there now, right? So I mean, when I started in the business, there was only a handful of states that really had licensure requirements and, and governance around what, what we do. Um, and obviously, you know, several states, many states have joined the bandwagon now to make sure there is some sort of um, oversight and licensure. So it helps a little bit, but n not yet. I mean, yeah. you know, when I got into it, there was, there was probably a dozen companies franchising home care. Today, there's probably 70 different companies. Trying it's kind to of confusing for, I mean, it's confusing for me. And like, I'm, I'm kind of in the weeds, like where I'm looking at all the data. I've spoken to numerous franchisees across brands, probably, you know, 12 franchisors. For me, it's, it sometimes is confusing, but I think once you start digging into like the franchisee satisfaction and right. some of the franchisors are in like, pretty bad legal battles with their franchisees and it's like all public record. And then it's like, okay, you can kind of distinguish some of, some of the different yeah. players. You absolutely can, you know, and I think, you know, this is my personal opinion, but I think, you know, over the next three to five years, we'll see a lot of consolidation. Yeah. Uh, we, have, <laughs> we have to for, for it to work out. And I, you know, I've, I've worked on that in the past uh, with my previous a place I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions of going and getting the mom and pops to either rebrand um, or buy them yeah. out and, and brand it you know so um you know i think that's that's going to be part of the the need and the direction uh, over the next three to five years to really yeah and that will benefit because some of these some of these franchisees are kind of stuck in systems where the average sales are like you know half a million where right. there's I don't know how many, maybe just six or seven that they their average sales are like past that million and like consistently hitting, you know, very solid financials. Yeah. Well, and you get, you know, you, you get people that want to come into the space because they're passionate about it. And then they look at, a, you know, a handful of different franchise organizations. They choose which one to go with. And then they just come in and think that it'll run itself, right? And so they end up only doing like $300,000 a year annual sales or $500,000. But they're not doing justice to what we're trying to deliver every day. And that's, that's where we're at in a challenge space right now, right? We, all of us in the, in the space, I don't care if it's, you know, home watch or one of our competitors, those of us that are in, in the top tier are trying to collaborate together to be like, how do we go out? It, it seems pretty collaborative. And I know I listened to the podcast you're on with disrupt, um, yeah. where you share a lot of information and. It, it does seem like pretty open and transparent and that people want to grow. And I've heard franchisees also talking across brands, even in the same uh, territory. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a critical component, right? I mean, I, I have monthly calls with some of my peers that are with the other brands. And, you know, we talk about, you know, we, we, we hold some things close to the vest, but we'll share other yeah. things that are going on. But, you know, we can't all cover, not one of us can cover the white space solely. So we competition's good. And you also want yeah, to especially when it's growing and you have the silver tsunami where it's not like frozen yogurt where demands like been going down year after year. Like yeah. this demand is yes. only getting bigger over the next. You would know better than me, but it looks like the next uh, fifteen years. There's nice. Yeah, well, in, the, in the next in the next twenty five years, the senior population will outweigh the youth population. So that's saying is like the the number of people sixty five plus will outweigh the number of people twenty or less. So wow. when you think about that, you know, that's huge. And that the eighties market really needs your help. I mean, I, I can't imagine what percentage of people in their eighties still living at home, like yep. have yeah, a caregiver, absolutely. but I would well, imagine it, it'd be quite high. It's, it is. So, and 90, it's something like 90%, give or take a couple percentage points of people that are 55 or older 
want to age in place or age at home. Yeah. That is. So the need for you live longer. That's the stats. That absolutely. You... <laughs> absolutely. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just when you walk into somebody's home and they're in their eighties, their attitudes, their personalities are so much different than if you walk into an assisted living facility and walk into somebody who's 80 years old, because then they're just sitting in there. <laughs> in my tent space doing nothing you know? so i just um, finished watching that blue zone series on netflix but he's always interviewing people at their homes whether it's yeah. in costa rica california japan and yeah homes yeah. with family eating well um but it does seem like a great way to age with dignity it, it absolutely is right i mean you it's your it's your comfort zone you've been there for however long you've been there and you know everything you know and and we Part of what we're doing with our innovation is really helping those types of people to um, you know, modify their homes so they can stay home, right? Because there's things like people don't realize. I mean, I go into my, my dad's garage and he has like a little stoop from, you know, that he has to step in to go into the house. And, you know, I'm always like, I, went, I never paid attention that you had that. But when the time comes, we'll put a ramp, you know, so you don't have to like step up if you can't. The little things like that that people don't realize that need to be modified in a home. And so we're working with some of our sister brands to be able to do things like that too, which is exciting to really prolong that need to ever move anywhere else. And that's, that's the positive thing where it's like such a small investment of like making a ramp can save literally gain years to your father's that's life, like to prevent like a fall and yeah. um, save a lot of money in medical costs. Yeah. Should there sure be a, bucks to put a ramp in is nothing. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice insurance yeah. policy. Absolutely. Todd, can you think of any tips for people, prospective franchisees, those that are looking to get into the franchise space? Yeah. And so in the home care space, you know, I think I might have said a little while ago, but it's really, it's, it's a passion driven place, right? So you have to make sure that you understand what the product is that's being delivered every day. That's, the, I always say it's very critical. The second piece, anybody that's getting into franchising, whether it's home care or franchising in general, is to have them understand like you're, you're given a box essentially from the, the franchise or, and it's what you choose to do with that box. Essentially that box is the system. And if you don't follow the system, you know, and you want to go rogue, you may not be successful. We have a proven path and, and that's what franchising is all about is a proven path from doing it over and over and repetitive on it. So it's really be mindful of that. Just follow the system. That's, that's what it's all about. And also like, if you're looking at getting in is, is do your validation. Right. Make sure that you are, are calling other uh, franchisees within that brand and, and asking the right questions, because there's a lot of things that we as a franchisor can't share during validation process. Um, but you can get that information from franchisees. So it's critical to make sure you have the right questions, do your homework, do your research. And then I'll also understand. I always say this is you're not buying yourself a job. You're buying yourself a lifestyle. You have to remember that because. That lifestyle may be 14, 18 hour days, some days and other days it may allow you to go to the kids uh, piano rehearsal or whatever it might be, but you're buying that lifestyle and not a job. Yeah, that's well said. And I think especially post pandemic, a lot of people, a lot of employees, especially white collar jobs have had a lot more job flexibility that a lot of people went into entrepreneurship wanting that that flexibility and employees more than ever, you know, have it. So the grass isn't always greener on the other side going into entrepreneurship. You got to really want it and, and be passionate about it, be willing to put in the hours. And I think I speak for a lot of entrepreneurs that it's, it's worth it. But, you know, come in uh, with eyes wide open. And, and thanks, Todd, for, for making that super clear. Um, yeah. that this is a serious endeavor and you have a lot of responsibility. You have, you're going to have payroll of 60 people's lives. Right. Right. You are, you, you know, you're suddenly every, every seat in the C-suite in your business, you're, you're running all of this when you start your own business, get into franchising. And you also are, you know, affecting, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, a hundred employees, depending on how, how fast you want to grow, you're affecting that. But then you're also, you know, very embedded in your community and you're changing the lives of, of hundreds of thousands of people every day um, by, by providing them a service to allow them to age in place with the dignity that they want. Todd, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you or your colleagues at HomeWatch if they're interested in exploring a franchise opportunity? Yeah, I think, you know, so the, the best thing is uh, to um, go to, to homewatchcaregivers.com. And on that page, we have a franchise link and they can click right on the franchise link and it'll take you right to our, our franchising site, give you all, uh, all sorts of different information. 
um, and then allow you to submit. And one of our uh, franchise development representatives reaches out from there. Uh, individual then moves into working with one of our franchise development managers who does all the franchise disclosure documents and puts you through validation, answers all the questions. And then the next step from there is we host a meet the team day, which is a lot of fun where candidates get to come into our support center and get to learn if they like me or not like me along with my <laughs> leadership team. Um, but no, I, I, being funny there, but they do, they do love us. They come in and we spend a day and a half with candidates um, and then your journey begins, you know, and it's exciting. Like we, we have a, a phenomenal franchise support team that helps do franchisees all the way through their journey with us. So if they're here for seven years, 10 years, 20 years, if somebody that's just about to celebrate their 28th year uh, with us as the brand. So it's exciting. Wow. Well, Todd, thanks so much for, for joining. And uh, we look forward to seeing people's comments on YouTube, as well as feedback across the social media channels as we we'll go out on. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Patrick. I appreciate it. It's been great. Appreciate it, Todd.